Welcome everyone. So today we're going to be reviewing the Aeronautica Companion. So it's not an unboxing as such, it's not a complete guide, it's just a, a general run through. Okay, so obviously lovely artwork in the very beginning. Yes, I will not be creasing the spine because uh, it feels like I'm breaking my own spine when I crease the spine of a book. So this is the Necron Doomside Squadron, Necron Night Shroud Squadron. They're pretty cool. But who can forget the Astartes underneath? So if I eventually get these guys, these Astartes, I will be painting them up like Battlestar Galactic um, Vipers. So the old white and red. So, list of contents here. Campaign rules. So, this is quite interesting. So they recommend, uh, obviously, two or more players. And between the players, you decide how long you want the campaign to last. So, it is a campaign where they recommend 200 to 250 points. It doesn't matter if a plane does get shot out of the sky because you can replace a plane with another plane of the same points value. So it gives an example here. So a Phoenix bomber is 23 points, it's destroyed. Uh, a Nightwing with a Twin Bright Lance upgrade is also 23 points, so perfect like for like. So the campaign why is the campaign any different from any normal games? So, you make a note of how many kills a plane gets. So they all start off as rookies and the pilots do get upgraded. They gain experience for every so many planes they get shot down, they get to roll on the ace pilot table. So the first upgrade is five kill points. So for example, if I was a Necron and I have killed five planes, get to roll on the table. And when you do roll on this table, if you get any duplicates, you get to re-roll the dice again. So for example, I could have Arcing Weaponry. This aircraft may re-roll one extra dice when firing at short range, which is pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to pick one at random. Supercharge. Once per game, this aircraft may treat its twin toaster destructive damage characteristic as 4. Plus. It's pretty nice. So we'll go for an Astartes one over here. Uh, randomly, Deadly Hunter. This aircraft may roll one extra dice when resolving tailing fire. It's pretty nice. And the lists go on. So that is pretty nice. So we have some new aircraft. So we have for the Imperial Navy the Marauder Pathfinder, the Marauder Colossus, Astra Materium, the Pathfinder and the Colossus, funny that. Tau Aircas uh, is Tau Auxiliary Aircraft, Orc Airwar, Looted Thunderbolt, Looted Marauder and Mega Bomber. So the Eldar. Uh, Vampire Raider, Vampire Hunter, Hemlock Wraith Fighter, Nightshade Interceptor. So I know Marcus is very excited about the vampires. Then we have some special rules here. Uh, okay, so I'll pick a couple at random. So stealth. Be it due to the small size, high speed or advanced cloaking systems, some aircraft can appear almost invisible to ground defences. Such aircraft can... Prove difficult to track, let alone target, rendering even the most sophisticated defense systems ineffective against them. Any weapon with the ground to air fire special rule, uh, targeting an aircraft with this special rule may reduce its effectiveness altitude by the number shown in the brackets next to the name of the special rule in the aircraft's profile. Which is pretty cool. So it only works to ground to air firing, eh. and not every game will have targets on the ground, but it's always nice. 
Jink, now we have seen Jink on a few of our battle reports previously, which is quite irritating. Um, being an Orc player, obviously I don't have Jink. We don't have that level of technology. We just have more DACA, and eventually one of them will hit. So basically, when this aircraft is chosen to fire during the firing phase, before step one, targeting, it may immediately move one hex in any direction. Note, however, the aircraft may not change its facing altitude or speed after making this move, or may not, nor may this movement take the aircraft into an occupied hex. So basically it means if you're outside of a field of fire, you could, let's say, move one hex and you may be in the field of fire. Or you don't want to do any shooting for whatever reason, and then you can jump out of an enemy's field of fire. That's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's rather irritating as well, especially if your sweet spot is, let's say, medium. So you jump out of short range into a medium. That's in, that helps you out. You know, it improves your chances, especially if your opponent's not really good at medium range. Very, very good. So the, here we have the Necrons. So we have the Necron upgrades. So galvanized nano swarms for four points. The Dynasty's Cryptex have modified the aircraft's nano swarms to facilitate quicker repair. Once per game, this aircraft may attempt a repair. During the end phase, roll a d6 for each lost point of structure. For each roll of a five up, repair a single point of structure. That's pretty nice. So it is once per game. So you really want to wait until there's a few wounds on there and try shrugging them off. It's pretty nice. There's some pretty nice upgrades in the whole of the book, actually. Uh, so I'll pick another one randomly. Phase shift for one point. Some Necron aircrafts can temporarily become incorporeal, causing munitions to pass right through them once per game. Uh, roll a d6 for each hit the aircraft suffers from a weapon with an ammo characteristic of one, two, or three. For each roll of a six, that hit becomes a miss. So basically, if someone's firing a missile, for example, ammo of two or something, streaks off towards you, it can go through you. That will be irritating. It's only on a six, but if it ever does happen, it's brilliant. For one point, if you've got one point that you need to spend, you've got, I don't know, 199, uh, then do it. Why not? It's one point. Uh, so you have the Night Scythe and the Doom Scythe here. If you want to pause it, and check that out. More than welcome. Four structure is always nice. Bit of transport. Throttle three is beautiful. Ace maneuvers is the big old one to eight. So sorry, Marcus. Eldar aren't the only ones who can do one to eight. Handling on a four up. Min speed is one. Max speed is eight, which is brilliant. Max altitude is five. So yeah, some nice weaponry as well. Twin link Tulsa destructor. Front arc only. Eight shots at short range, four medium, two at long, damage on a four up, extra damage on a six up. So as per always with the Aeronautica books, or even boxes in fact, the artwork is beautiful. So I do like the look of those guys. Probably not the paint scheme I would go for, but still very, very nice. Uh, so the Astartes, so we have the Xiphon Interceptor, which has been doing the rounds, people have seen those before. The Storm Eagle Assault Craft. How cool is that picture? The Fire Raptor. So in the last box, when you had the Astartes, you didn't have both the Fire Raptor and the Storm Eagle. So that's one with missile pods and last cannons. Here we have one with Avenger bolt cannons, bolters, and missile launchers. Both look pretty damn cool. And there's the Thunderhawk gunship, people. Structure 8. That's pretty good. <laughs> Transport is 4. Throttles 2, which is still more than I thought it was going to be. Ace maneuvers 1 to 4. Probably predictable. Handling on a 3-up. It can remain stationary. Min speed is 0. Max speed is 5. Max altitude is 5. So it is 44 points, which is hefty. So turbo laser destructor. Front 
and up is two, two and a three. So long range is better. Damage is on a two up, which is nice. So it's last cannon territory, extra damage on four ups. Then it has twin last cannons as well. So sweet spot is medium range with two shots. Nothing close combat. But once again, has extra damage, but this time only on a six. They have the port, uh, heavy bolter, and starboard heavy bolter. Four, so short range, one medium range, nothing long range. And then you have the heavy bolters and bolter turrets. So if you were um, pretty close, you, you're going to get probably eight shots off with the, the bolters. And then it may be a couple of shots with the laser destructor, which is okay. It's not too bad. That's not too bad. Uh, but it has got a lot of structure to stay around. The fact that its um, port and starboard heavy bolters are all round is pretty nice. So normally, like if I'm playing my tiny little DACA jets, I'm looking for front arc only. These guys have a nice field of view, even though they don't have a bazillion shots. They do have the hole to survive, and it's, it's, it's pretty reasonable. They're not massively fast, but the fact that they can stop, that's something that really is. Okay, so before we had like flak missiles for the, the ground defences. This time around we have the Sky Spear Missile Launcher and the Icarus Storm Cannon Array. So, uh, the Icarus Storm Cannon Array, I'll pick. We can just talk about that briefly. I'm not going to run through everything in this book because you haven't got all day. Uh, structure, two points. And shots at short range is five, medium range is five, long range is two. Damage on a five up, which isn't bad. It's okay. Uh, because its effective altitude is three. Um. It's okay. I was expecting someone else, maybe extra rules for nine points, but it's not bad. Whereas the uh, the Sky Spear has less shots, seven points. Nine points is still quite cheap. You know, I always take extra DACA, uh, which is three points. That's three ships with extra shots. Um, I mean, that's six shots. You know, between those three ships, whereas that's five shots by itself. Uh, would you take it? Maybe, because alright, it's one less shot, but you've got two more structure technically there. But it's getting ships close enough so these things are actually effective and put some shots out. That's the difficulty. So here we have a few aces, so a couple of named characters. So this is the Dark Fire. So this is the Fire Raptor gunship. It is 36 points which is not cheap. So the special rule is battlefield repairs once per game. This character, Argon Falchin, yeah, totally butchered that, may attempt a repair. During the end phase, roll a d6 for each lost point of structure. On a roll of six, repair a single point of structure. Okay, so tech marine pilot does what tech marine pilots expect. Basically, eh, it's not too bad. Not too bad. Uh, usual lots of shots. Um, so, this is the missile variant because it is the Fire Raptor. Uh, it's not too bad. You got six uh, port side, six starboard uh, at close range. The Avenger Bolt Cannon is really nice. I do like that gun, uh, but its sweet spot is medium range. And the missile launchers, you don't really care where you're hitting, because it's two, two, and two. Uh, it does do extra damage on sixes, and the fact that it damages on three is not bad. Okay, another character there. We have the Eldar, and the Xenos Trickery. So we have a Nightwing there. Lovely looking plane. 20 points. As to be expected, it does the one to eight Ace maneuvers, throttle of three, handling of two, well, they're pretty much the best in the galaxy. 
Uh, minimum speed of 2, maximum speed of 8. So They are a bit squishy when you first initially look at them. But when planes have jink and things like that, because it says special rules, jink there, they are a bit tricksy. You think you got them, you think, ah, oh, they're only two structure, but no. They get to pick pretty much where they want to go. And with the mo mo bleh, and the maneuvers are great, so one to eight, you can do what I want. Phoenix Bomber, like I said, feel free to pause it and have a look. The Vampire Raider, which looks so cool. It really does. Beautiful model. And that is the slightly bigger one. It is 33 points, but it does have 5 structure, which is impressive for Eldar, because normally they are quite frail with the 2 structure. Vampire Hunter, 36 points. Hemlock Reef Fighter, 26 points. Once again, like I said, only 2 structure. So, it's got a heavy D scythe. So he's got three shots, three shots, and zero shots at long range. Not lots of shots, but tricky to get hold of. A throttle of three is just insane. They can just ramp up that speed and go wherever they want. Um, okay, so there is the Nightshade Interceptor, but the ground defences for the Eldar is looking nice. Pulsar platform is ten points, and the Spinner platform is eight points. So not many shots from the Pulsar platform, uh, but extra damage on sixes is always nice. And damaging on twos is nuts. You just gotta get those planes within shooting range. So effective altitude is three. So you really gotta drag them down. Step at five and you can't hit me. Okay, some aces as well for the Eldar. Pretty nice. Do love the artwork. Good old Beltan paint scheme there. And uh, so special rules. Uh, once per game, when an enemy aircraft fires at this aircraft with long range, it must reroll any successful hit rolls for natural five or six. Note that should this aircraft stall or fall into a spin, this upgrade does not apply. That's probably because the pilot's trying to sort the plane out and not trying to dodge shots. But that's nasty. So shooting that thing at long range, yeah. That's horrible. Now, looted vehicles. I do like looted vehicles. It should happen more in 40k. It's not at the moment unless you're in campaign. But <clears throat> in Aeronautica, there is Orc looted vehicles. So the two types of Imperial aircraft prized by Orcs that are looted for their own purpose. These are Thunderbolt Fighters and the Indominal Marauder Bomber. Such aircraft will often retain much of the original weaponry and technology, but will be tinkered with and modified to improve in brackets their performance by the new Orc owners. An Orc force may include one looted Imperial aircraft for every five Orc aircrafts in their force. Only Imperial aircraft can be looted by Orcs are the Thunderbolt Fighter and the Marauder Bomber. Other aircrafts are deemed too flimsy to appeal to Orcs' taste. Yeah. Okay, so any Orc looted Imperial aircraft included in the Orc force may be given an Orc air wah, aircraft upgrades. Uh, they may not be given Imperial aircraft upgrades such as the frivolous technology has been ripped away and discarded. So, Orc bombs and missiles. But I do like the look of, can you imagine a proper Orc um, ace pilot in a looted Thunderbolt? That's going to be wicked. Um, I think it's pretty fun. Obviously, they're a little bit cheaper because they're not so good like the extra damage is on a 6 plus um, but orcs generally don't get that anyway because you look at the DACA jet for example or 90% of the orc stuff the uh, the damage is on 5's they're hitting on 5's and the damage is on 5's the fact that someone's going to be damaging on 2's is insane for orcs they loves that 
But that is a twin last cannon with two shots at sweet range. So, yeah. um, quad auto cannons, two, six, and zero. So, surely if it has the orc keyword, it can have extra DACA for three points. Hmm. That would be pretty nice. So, rolling um, eight dice in the sweet spot instead for the quad auto cannon. Uh, Luton Marauder and the good old orc murder bomber. So it is a structure of 10, but it is 51 points. So as you can imagine, yes, it's got lots and lots of weapons. It is a flying fortress, but it's the bombs where it's at. So this thing is fantastic to take out ground targets, doing extra damage on four ups with some big bombs. Um, like I said, it does have a fair number of shots, as in loads and loads of different guns. The dorsal mounted flak cannon, is all round and up is eight shots, which is quite unusual because dorsal doesn't normally have that many shots. Uh, so that is pretty cool. Uh, but remember, it has to be up or the, the, the um, same altitude. It cannot shoot below. So that's pretty nice. Uh, like I said, the mega bomb, extra damage on fours, nothing to be sniffed at. So then we have some kind of species called Tau, which I've never even heard of. Obviously joking. Uh, but they can take human aircraft as well, for the greater good. Uh, not that they really care about the technology, because their technology is far superior. Uh, they just like to roll in humans and other species into their own. Marauder Colossus. Okay. So the expanded rules, these rules you do not have to take, uh, but obviously if you want to use them, have a chat with your opponent before they would come into effect at the beginning of the game. Just say, would you like to use blah, blah, blah. So for example, limited ammunition. So normally missiles and rockets and things like that have an ammo count. And I often find if you spend money on a missile, it generally misses. Unless you're using a grot bomb. And even if they miss, they're still flown around. And I love those little guys. They just look great. But this rule uh, is a little, little chart here to work out how many shots of regular ammo your plane will have. So the more um, FPR, so let's say your orcs, and it's eight... Uh, six and zero you add them together and uh, you, you total up how many shots they have throughout the game which is how much ammo they would have as well so the ammo characteristic is measured in rounds so we've got five chances there in the mid section for example um, for orcs shoot him so mm, that's on a DACA jet so it's got five turns. I mean, it does happen in the in the first phase, but not every time. Definitely happens in the second phase if they're still alive. There's not many games that goes to the full twelve, but you certainly will not be shooting twelve turns if you want to use this. So it's a bit of fun. I'm not sure it's going to see much competitive play, but maybe a few missions might be quite funny if they're, you know. Oh, in no man's land, they can't refuel, they can't restock on ammo. They've got to use it a bit sparingly. Could be quite fun. You might see it on our battle reports, uh, but not for competitive games on the channel. Okay, so the expanded damage. So with the expanding damage, whenever you take the additional damage, when you roll, uh, let's say, I don't know, a plane has extra damage on sixes, it's not always flat out damage. So you roll the table and something cool could happen instead. Uh, so let's, like number three for example. A serious hit has caused fuel lines to rupture and the aircraft has begun to billow flames. Place a flame token beside the model on the tabletop or on its aircraft card. Flame tokens may be removed at the end of the phase. So that's pretty cool. Aircraft starts catching on fire. Um, let's pick number two. The engine is hit and begins belching smoke. Place a smoke token beside the model 
on the card once again, blah, blah, blah. Smoke tokens may be removed at the end of the phase. Okay, so what do they mean by fire and smoke, for example? Because that's two things we haven't had before. So, uh, smoke, uh, if the aircraft is billowing flames, remove the smoke token from beside the model and on a time top or on the card and replace it with a flame token. So, if you don't put the fire out, uh, there's a chance that you mm, uh, don't put the smoke out. There's a chance it will catch on fire. Remember, where there's smoke, there's fire. On a three plus, however, the aircraft continues to belt smoke. Nothing happens, and the aircraft retains the token. So it's only on a one or two you burst into flames. On a three up, you continue to smoke. So there's a chance if you start smoking again, you will burst into flames. So it's just something a bit of fun, isn't it? However, fire, one or two, the aircraft continues to billow flames and immediately use it, loses structure points. So this happens until basically the plane is destroyed. On a three up, the flames are extinguished, but the aircraft continues to billow smoke. So it's kind of died down a little bit. It's still smoking. There's still a chance that the flames could come back. But continually taking damage... It's pretty nasty while you're on fire, but it does make sense. Okay, so here we have the expanded ace abilities. So a bit more than you got in the standard books. Um, so here we have, let's pick number one point. Um, let's pick cool headed for one point, add a one to the dice roll when testing to recover from a stall with an aircraft. Hmm, that's okay. I uh, don't stall too much, but with these new smoking rules and things like that, there is a chance to stall a bit more than you normally would. Uh, for two points, no fear. Should this aircraft suffer any damaging hits as a result of ending its movement in a hex occupied by another aircraft, roll a d6 for each hit. On a 5+, plus, a single damaging hit is ignored and the structure point that would have been lost as a result is not lost. So, it's not very often you bump into an enemy aircraft, but you basically, on a 5-up, you can ignore it. It's pretty nice. Probably not something I would have picked for two points. I think I would probably spend two points on something else. So, it tells you about match play scenarios. So, you can have the random table for the scenarios, rather than choosing it. You roll for it. Um... And then you have reserves rolls, which, to be fair, I don't often use reserves, especially with orcs. They're not that clever. Just kind of chuck a load of aircraft on the table. Now, we have used bad weather before, hence the clouds. And we have used nighttime fighting on our battle reports before, just the once. But there are terrain rules. So it's a bit vague, but it does suggest, because you don't need terrain in the game, but it would be nice to dress the table, wouldn't it? Look kind of different. Look quite nice. Um, so it's basically saying if you have a hill, they recommend it being at altitude one or two, uh, whereas a mountain could be three or four, for example. There's always a chance that you can fly over it rather than crashing into it. Um, so any ground defences sighted on, um, terrain features, just add the altitude on the... Um, said ground defences which is pretty nice um, if you hit a terrain uh, all remaining structure points are lost and the aircraft is immediately removed from play which makes sense because uh, if you hit a mountain you're not just going to be clipped or just take a little bit of hole damage like a bullet passing through if you hit a mountain a mountain is definitely bigger than a bullet just saying so that's pretty cool. I do like that. So that's that. Um, so on the match play here, it does tell you about certain deployment zones and match play scoring as well. Um, so if you win, you get three match play points. If you draw, you get one. If you lose, you get zero. So yes, the deployment maps are here, which is pretty good. Um, you don't have to use it, but... It's different, you know, normally you place within three hexes on your side, or you could always use the reserves. But having a random 
dueling aces map like that could be quite fun. Okay. Um, and once again, dueling aces. This is a new scenario, which is pretty nice. So it does say the game lasts for either 12 turns or until one side is forced to disengage or until only one player has aircraft left operating. Um, but how often do you see Aeronautica going on for 12 turns? I hear you saying, well, I must have played 30 games in this and I think it's happened once, which was on our last battle report actually. Okay, so No Man's Land. It's nice, like I said, nice to see the different deployment maps for each one. Because before it just suggested you can like I said, deploy within three hexes. But it's another mission here. So feel free to pause it if you want to read through all the little nitty gritty bits. Uh, but this one obviously has nighttime fighting, bad weather, on a 3 plus, no additional rules. So, I mean, you don't have to use weather conditions, but it really does change things up. And it makes it look more realistic as well. Another mission called Troop Insertion. So, three missions in this book. Very, very good. So, just to sum up, some brilliant upgrades for your ships. Nice artwork. Uh, three fleshed out scenarios. Additional rules for ammo, for example, if you want to use it. Additional rules for those extra damaging hits, so you may only be bellowing smoke out. I say only, you can still catch on fire from that, for example. And a tiny little section on terrain, which I'll get into on our next video. Hoping to make some terrain for Aeronautica Imperialis. But, like I said, it is a little bit vague in the rule set in this book about terrain. But it's the kind of game you don't need terrain, like I said. But we want to use it because it looks fun. So we have used clouds previously. And Marcus has used um, cotton wool for that. So he's made a load of cotton wool balls. And it was just so much fun. And I think we're definitely going to be using that again. But yes, really do rate this book. It isn't essential, um, but it's nice to have something for every faction there. So you've got Necrons, you've got your new Necron vehicles. You've got Eldari, you've got your new Eldari vehicles. Orcs, they've got the big bomber, which is quite nice, but the fact that they can loot some vehicles, very thematic. So it does unlock quite a bit, or like I said, you can just play straight from the box. You don't need this book. But if you're serious about Aeronautica, pick this book up. It's not very expensive at all. Extra upgrades, extra planes, extra rules, extra missions. What is there not to like? Really do rate this book. Thank you, Marcus, for letting me steal this. Um, I mean, acquire it, liberate it. Uh, yeah, stealing was probably the right word. And covering what this book contains. Thank you very much, guys, for listening to me waffle on yet again. Please hit that like button if you haven't done already, and please, please subscribe for some more great hobby content. Stay safe, everyone.